Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm glad that everyone is here, and I'm in a different position now, so I'm, I'm in the corner. Uh, can everyone hear me fine online? Yes. Okay. Yes. And um, what, what at last in the Shingi, I mentioned that often the uh, discussions that take place on a given Wednesday night follow several patterns. And one of the patterns is that we have certain set things a year, such as Shakyamuni Buddha's birthday, Shakyamuni Buddha's birth, the awakening, uh, Jigi's memorial, Saicho's memorial. And next year, by the way, Saicho, it's 1,200 years since Saicho's death. So next year in Japan, that's going to be a very big deal with, uh, with Tendaishu and Iezan. And, um, and obviously we have, among other things, the, the times for the solstices and for Ogigan, which takes place during the equinox, the spring and fall. So one of those, those so that's, that's probably, I don't know how many I counted off to that, maybe 10, something like that. So those are 10 or 12 topics a year that are sort of dictated by events that we just do on a regular basis. And this evening is uh, Chi Gi. Now, as I've said, as I said in the Shingi, one of the, the things that's interesting about that is that if I do all of those things every year, I've been doing this for now 26 years. And there, so sometimes you're going to hear the same thing over and over again because there's only so many takes on, on a given, a given uh, event such as Ohigan. Ohigan we do twice a year. Um, but these are really important things. And these are things that, that are useful to uh, remind people about, to review what was important and what wasn't important. And I realized that someone, when I'd asked a few months, few, uh, actually probably a few months ago, I was asking, what are some of the topics that people would like to see? And one of them was, what makes Tendai distinctive? That was one of the topics that, we, that people asked for. And next, well, in January, is going to be Saicho's uh, Memorial Day. And so we can talk about Tendai, what makes Tendai distinctive at that time. But realistically, what makes Tendai distinctive actually comes from what makes Tien Tai distinctive. And just so that you're perfectly aware of what I'm doing here, Tien Tai is referring to the Chinese school that was started in the sixth century, and Tendai is the Japanese school, which came about in 804. So this is and what and and what I find really fascinating about the two figures. Jigi, and I, I sometimes I'll pronounce it the Japanese way, which is Chi Gi, and sometimes I'll try to pronounce it the Chinese way, which is Wei Yi. You know, it depends upon what I'm doing, but I, I always screw that up, so I try to say Chi Gi. And um, one of the things that's distinctive about both um, Chi Gi and Saicho, Dengyo Daishi, founded Tendai in Japan. And it's, it's a point that I try to make about as Buddhism goes out of Asia. And that is that Buddhism entered China somewhere around the first century CE. And when we say entered China, without a doubt, there had been Indian monks in China previous to that. But it was only really um, acknowledged by the emperor in the first century CE. So we, we use that first century date as a as a milestone. But from the first century CE through until the sixth century CE, you had many schools of Buddhism that were, I really will say, blossoming in China. And, and keep in mind also, when we talk about China, China during that period of time, from the time of Shakyamuni Buddha until, uh, until the present, doesn't look the way it does now. It's only looked 
the way it does now, really in the last uh, approximately 70 plus years. Um, and it was based upon where was the emperor residing. That's where China was. And the imperial lineage changed locations periodically as a result of, of you know, imperial stuff. <laughs> okay. Without <laughs> going into a lot of detail. And but what, what I find really fascinating is that it took from the first century CE until Qi in the sixth century for Buddhism really to become Chinese. That is to say that there were Indians, people from India, monks from India. Actually, when we think of, of some Kamala Shila wasn't actually from India. Kamala Shila was from north of India in, in the, the steppes region uh, as Mahayana spread north and and east as well as south and east. Um, and so when Buddhism was spreading into China, you had many people, many people from the Indian subcontinent and other places who were bringing teachings into what was then China in the area of China. And, but it remained Indian. It was really, in a, in you, you had Confucianism, which was there. You had Taoism, which was there. Taoism and, and Buddhism are rather contemporaneous in terms of their founding, uh, same periods of time. And you had, Buddhism coming across and various <coughs> emperors had subscribed to Buddhist teachings. And, and one of the things that we'll see <coughs> is that one of the, the reasons for his popularity was he actually gave the Bodhisattva vows to one of the emperors uh, during his time. And so when we think of Qi Di, he's seminal for a seminal figure in not only Chinese Buddhism, because he changed what we think of as Buddhism in China from an Indian religion into a Chinese religion. Now, this was a, um, a process by which it was changing little by little by little by little. But let me go through this, this handout that you should have been able to get as a, as a download when the invite was sent out. Um, and we also see that his Memorial Day is actually designated as November 24th. So um, that we're a little bit early. On the other hand, November 24th, we're not going to be having a uh, um, meditation that evening or a service that evening. So that's why I'm doing it this evening. Um, <coughs> The first, pair, the first um, bullet point that I make is that Chigi is known as the great systematizer. And that's one of the things I want to point out at this time. There were a number of different methodologies being employed around the time of Chigi to systematize Buddhism. And this was necessary because Buddhism was really rather like Buddhism is in America today. There's a, a, a parallel development of those two processes. You know, if, if you go online and you begin to check out, you just type in Buddhism, and you're going to get Tibetan Buddhism, you're going to get Pure Land Buddhism, you're going to get Zen Buddhism, you're going to get Rishikosakai, you're going to get Sogagakai, you're going to get all kinds of different forms of Buddhism. And if you read what, and, and if it's Tibetan, there's going to be maybe four or five different trends of Tibetan Buddhism. If you discuss Japanese Buddhism, there's going to be 13 or more traditions, large traditions are going to be mentioned to say nothing of Korean or Vietnamese or Thai or Burmese, et cetera, et cetera. Well, these all look, uh, they all seem to have a thread running through them, and that thread might be, they all call themselves Buddhist. 
But when you look at the practices and you look at some of the teachings, they're very disparate. There's not a lot that holds them together for the most part. And so when we talk about the systematization that Chigi employed, what we're talking about was that he had, um, he was the, one of the first major figures to classify all of the Buddhist teachings into categories and into time periods. And he essentially taught that Buddha was teaching the same message. It was one message. However, different people were able to receive it. They, different people had a different capacity for receiving it. Different people had a different way of understanding it. Some people were not necessarily open to the particular message that he was trying to deliver at a particular time, but maybe a little bit later, other people were open to that message, that sort of thing. So Chi Gi had systematized the teachings into a recognizable format. Now, so when we say, well, what makes Tiantai distinctive? That's, the, that's number one, is that we have a system that is not saying this teaching is better than that teaching or another teaching is better than another. They're saying that this teaching was perhaps an incomplete teaching, another teaching was perhaps a partial teaching, another teaching was a teaching that needed to be elaborated further, but people weren't ready for it at the time. But it doesn't look at it and say there's only one way that people will understand this. Now, there are schools of Buddhism that actually say, no, this is the truth. This is it. And Tiantai did not do that. And I will add that, that Tendai doesn't do that. And so that's one of the, the aspects. And so there was a unification of Buddhism under Qi Gi. And it's interesting because it took from the first century to the fifth century we'll say 400 years uh, approximately for Buddhism in China to become Chinese. Now, what's interesting is if you go to Japan a little bit later, Buddhism was formally introduced into Japan in the sixth century, around 500, well, it depends, 539, 550, depending upon which date one wants to use. But that was formally. I mean, obviously, Buddhism had been brought by monks from Korea, well, from actually from, from uh, Shila and from China previously, but it had not been formally observed. It had not been formally accepted uh, by the imperial court of Japan at that time. So that was in the sixth century. But it wasn't until the beginning of the ninth century in 804 with Saicho that Buddhism had gone from being a Indian through Korea, through China, to Japan form of Buddhism. Saicho made Buddhism Japanese. And, and at another time when we discuss uh, Saicho, we'll We'll discuss that in more detail. So what's interesting is you had a lapse of 400 years in um, one case, 300 plus years in another case, almost 400 years in another case in Asia before Buddhism had become either Chinese or Japanese. Now you had a similar, similar scenario in Korea. You had a similar scenario in Vietnam. That is to say that Buddhism doesn't become part of that nation's heritage, part of that culture until several hundreds of years after its formal introduction. And so one of the things that I, that I think about is when people talk about American Buddhism, Buddhism has been in, the, in North America for approximately, well, since the middle of the, of the 19th century. Uh, that was brought over by Chinese, Japanese, and other 
uh, immigrants from Asia who brought Buddhism over at that time. And actually, by the beginning of the 19th century, um, by eight, well, by 1893, with the Parliament of, Relig of Religion in Chicago, there was a formal introduction of Buddhism. And it had begun to take hold, but then it sort of fell away. It dropped out. And it wasn't until the latter part of the 1950s um, with people like, like D.T. Suzuki and Maizumi Roshi and the exiles from Tibet that Buddhism began being introduced in a different way, in a more acceptable way at that point into the American milieu. And so how many years is it going to be until we have an American Buddhism? I would suggest that it's going to take a figure like a sideshow or a chi di before we have an American Buddhism. Right now, we have many American sangha, but we don't really have an American Buddhism. And so uh, going back to chi di, um, he was criticized. He, one of the things that, that he really was very uh, known for and Tiantai Buddhism is known for, I mean, to, to begin with, he was prolific. He produced any number of teachings and writings that have been passed down since his time uh, in various ways. Um, and so he was prolific. And so what he had, what he had, and I, I I can't say that he had written about because what he had done was he had given discourses. Those discourses were then made into notes. The notes were then made into texts that were then later passed down in some cases. That's the case of the Mon Chi Kuan. And, and then it had been lost and wasn't discovered until a number of years later by a Korean monk who brought it back uh, from Korea. And that's what we use today is that version of the Mo Chi Kwan. But he was prolific in terms of the material he produced and the ideas that he advocated for. Are there any questions before I go on? I'm gonna take just a moment to say, maybe somebody's got a question about something I was talking about and you're gonna wait till I finish. So why don't I ask now if there's any questions right now? And look, I, I can look over here. Mm -hmm. I don't have to. Look behind me. Any questions? Yes, Aaron. So one question I have is that, let's say I want to believe in yoga, something like yoga karo, yoga kara, like metaphysics in Buddhism. Would I say that's a conventional truth following Jihi? Or would I state that's like an ultimate truth? That would be a conventional truth. Okay. Okay. And, and just to, to clarify, why don't you explain to people who don't know what Yogacara is, <laughs> what Yogacara would... would... Um, Yogacara is um, consciousness-only Buddhism. It kind of postulates that there's this thing called the seed consciousness that right. acts as a place where all consciousness originates in. And in some sense, it kind of explains the phenomenology, how we individually experience things such as when we um, meditate. Because the idea is that in certain sense, there's certain pathways and patterns that are expressed in the totality, that unity, that are mirrored in the individual. Right. And just to clarify what, what Aaron was talking about, there is another school called Majamaka School. And the Majamaka School um, has a different perspective. And without going into the details, that Majamaka School actually, uh, those two trends, the Okachara and Majamaka, were two major trends or tendencies. You can't really call them schools. They weren't, they really weren't schools in the way we normally think about schools in the Buddhist context. They were really trends of thought. And one of the things that's interesting is you can classify one tradition as more Dogichara and another tradition as more Majamaka. And, and we can say, I would say without a doubt that Tantai and Tendai is more Majamaka than Yogacara by, by contrast. Um, on the end, a, a school like Shingonshu in Japan is more Yogacara by contrast. On the other hand, 
you can't have one without the other. <laughs> They're complementary. They really work together. They're not competing schools so much as they are complementary schools. And although if you read only one and not the other, you get the impression that, well, this is the way it must be. That goes back to what we were talking about before, that unification of Buddhism, to be able to say that you need both Majamaka and Yogacara, uh, that they're both present in all the philosophies that we're looking at is part of that unification process, as opposed to saying, I'm only gonna address one or the other. And just going back to, any other questions? Yeah, can you speak to these two? Well, he, may I? Sensei, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, that uh, Yogacara program is interesting. And the, uh, of course, at the time of GE, six centuries, uh, Yogacara system was introduced into China. Uh, and uh, I think uh, GE was a little bit influenced by Yogacara system, uh, dividing 10, uh, what should I say, uh, 10, 10 uh, stages, like, uh, uh, you know, 3,000 uh, realities in a single moment of consciousness, and their uh, system adapted, uh, in a sense, I think, Yogacara way, 10 stages of Buhumi, we call it, you know. And uh, so, uh, really mixed uh, uh, teachings between Yogacara and Madhyamika by Nagarjuna. And Nagarjuna system is a basis. This is emptiness, you know. But uh, what we uh, realize emptiness is through our mind consciousness. Uh, uh, so the Asanga and Basbandu developed that system of the consciousness uh, only that is yoga chara. Yoga is to unite uh, myself to Buddha. Uh, and chara is uh, uh, practice, how to uh, so you, uh, how to connect between Buddhism, uh, Buddha and me. So me in Buddha, Buddha in me, like this kind of system, really uh, interesting to develop Buddhist uh, uh, philosophy and psychology, I think. But anyway, uh, this is very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Did that answer your question? Pushing? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I apologize. I have to go in an emergency, but that completely answered it. I had another question related to practice related to that, and I might email you. Okay, that'd be fine, Aaron. Hope everything works out with your emergency. No, thank you. It's something related to my parents. I apologize. Okay, that's <clears throat> understandable. Um, just going on, uh, I, and I point this is the, the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth bullet point down, and actually it's a hot end that are there, not really bullets, just to be, just to be precise. Um, and there's a point that, and I'll, I'm just gonna read this. GE is generally regarded as the de facto founder of the Kiantai school, named for the two mountains. Well, for the mountain, not the two mountains, the mountain where GE built is uh, the most important monastery. He, he had several monasteries that he built, but the first one was on, was on Tiantai because it was associated closely with the rulers of the Sui dynasty. Um, and Tiantai suffered an eclipse with the, rank, with the rise of the Yang Tang dynasty in the sixth to ninth century, whose rulers were eager to disassociate themselves from the ideological underpinnings of the Sui rule. The school was revived, and I think that this is important. It's not, it, it puts an, an interesting slant on talking about Qi Ki. The school was revived a century and a half later by the monk Zhang Ran uh, in 711 to 782, one of whose disciples transmitted the Tiantai teachings to the Japanese monk Saicho when Saicho was in China uh, in 804. And Saicho in turn introduced the lineage to Japan where it soon became the dominant tradition, et cetera. So you see the direct transmission from, I mean, very direct transmission. Excuse me, I'm just... Yes, hello. Now, I'm 
So what was I saying? Choto, 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 just a minute. <laughs> the the right transmission right. from uh, uh, right. John so Ryan. it's interesting because you, when you look at Chiki, he's considered the third patriarch or third ancestor of Tiantai. And as the third ancestor, uh, the, the first two ancestors, one was his teacher, and the other was Hua uh, uh, Wen, and then Hua Su, with the, the, those were the first two. And so he was the third. Well, it was really only very few after that patriarchs or ancestors of Tiantai that we have the direct transmission to Saicho in Japan and Saicho bringing the Tiantai teachings. And that was why he had gone to Japan specifically. He'd mm -hmm. gone to Japan, Saicho had gone to Japan to obtain the, I mean, I'm sorry, gone from Japan to China specifically to obtain um, the Lotus Sutra teachings as it was referred to, the Tiantai teachings, as well as um, Mikyo or esoteric teachings. And while he was there, he did that as well as picked up methods of meditation. And those things he brought back to, brought back to China. He was sent there by the, by the emperor. In a sense, it was like a, a, uh, uh, a diplomatic mission, a Japanese mission to China to bring those materials back. But it's really interesting, the, the direct trend, the direct lineage through Qi Yi to Saicho in Japan. So when we talk about Tendai in Japan today, philosophically, there's very little that's different between Tiantai as it was taught, not necessarily just at the time of Qi Yi, but certainly by the time of, of Zhenron, uh, several uh, generations later um, into, into Japan. So it's the Tiantai and the Tendai is really one and the same in that respect. The, the biggest difference was that there were additional teachings regarding the esoteric teachings that were added to the Tendai. And in Japan, that's referred to as Taimitsu, uh, which is the Tendai way of looking at the esoteric teachings. Um, one of the other, you see some of the works that are here, and I'm not going to mention those per se. You can you can read them and 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 see what they are easily enough. But the other thing that's interesting is three thousand realms in a single moment, and I'll just use the quote that actually comes from Mo Chi Quan, which is life at each moment is endowed with ten worlds. At the same time, each of the 10 worlds is endowed with all 10 worlds, so that an entity of life actually possesses 100 worlds. Each of these worlds, in turn, possesses 30 realms, which means that in 100 worlds, there are 3,000 realms, and the 3,000 realms of existence are all possessed by life in a single moment. If there is no life, that is the end of the matter. But if there is the slightest bit of life, it contains all the 3,000 realms. This is what we mean when we speak of the region of the unfathomable. And what this is basically speaking to is that each moment, there are 3,000 potentials that exist. What do we do in that moment? How do we optimize, how do we realize, how do we manifest the life that we live from moment to moment? You know, we, we think about, you know, it, it's really interesting. Today, if you talk to a group of people, they're going to talk about their career, and they're going to say, I have a career as a, pick a profession, whatever it might be. And there's a career trajectory that many people have. Many of us don't have a career project, for, uh, career trajectory. Many of us have a life <laughs> as opposed to a career. But each moment, there is a new opportunity for change. There is a new potential that exists. And that in, its, in and of itself is like a continual rebirth. 
And yet we view what we've done as here's what I've done. I've got to continue on this path for whatever reason. Maybe that's a good thing. On the other hand, maybe we should stop according to this idea and look at these 3,000 potentials in a given moment and recognize that we have an opportunity to be reborn in how we live our lives from moment to moment. Now, each of these, the 3,000 realms include the realms that are all the way up, you know, all the way down, I should say, if I'm going to give directionality to it, from the hell realms all the way up through the, the hungry ghost realms, the animal realms, the Asura realms, the human realms, the diva realms, etc. And we have that opportunity each moment. Am I going to be at this moment in the hungry ghost realm? Am I going to be in the hell realm? Am I going to be in the human realm? Or a Asura or a diva, whatever it might be. And this is a continual process. And it, it suggests that it's not to say that a person should not have a fear. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's not to say that a person doesn't have an order to their life. However, our lives are not, we don't control our lives to the degree that we think we do. We control our lives much less than we think we do. And there's a lot of other stuff that's taking place uh, throughout this moment to moment. And the point that one of the points that, that Chi Gi was making with the 3,000 realms in one moment is that we must consciously make a decision. Am I going to do this or that? More often than not, we don't make a decision. We live out of habit. I'm going to do this because that's what I do, whatever that might be. But he's making the argument in 3,000 realms in a single moment of life is that, and I, and I really appreciate this last two sentences, but if there's a slightest bit of life, it contains all 3,000 realms. And by that, we're not just talking about human beings. We're talking about all sentient beings. If there's the slightest bit of life, there's an opportunity and a potential. And so Chi Yi was to, to recapitulate just a little bit, was really the person that we can identify as the, the foundation of Chinese Buddhism. And the Buddhism that he taught in the sixth century had a profound effect on the other forms of Buddhism that were in China, such as Cha'an. His um, Shoshikan was instrumental the short manual of meditation was instrumental in Cha'an or Chinese Zen meditation, the schools and the, and the methods that they used. His teachings were instrumental in the Pure Land philosophies that existed in China before his, before his birth, but they were modified by his teachings as time went on. And then, of course, he became instrumental in the foundation of the Buddhism in Japan, because through Saicho, during the Kamakura period, you have all these other schools flourishing because they had been Tendai monks on Hiezan, such as the two Zen schools of Soto and Rinzai, and the Pure Land School, and the, uh, the true Pure Land School, Jeroshu, Jeroshinshu, and Nichidenshu, and others. There are many others that those are the major ones that we talk about. Um, and so we, this all, in one manner or the other, goes back to Chi Yi. And I find it really remarkable. And I think it's, it's worthwhile remembering him at least once a year. Any other questions? I can't believe that nobody has another yeah. question. Yes. No, over here, please. Um, was there a precursor to the to his uh, three thousand realms? It was this purely of I can't say purely of his creation, but was there what what? How did that kind of? I, maybe Ichishima Sensei could answer that. I've got an idea, but I'm not. It's not really as. What What do you think, Sensei? Was there a precursor to the three thousand realms in 
a moment. And you're muted, by the way, right? A sensei, you're sensei, you're muted. Okay. Uh, 3,000 realities in a single moment of consciousness. This is the really basic teachings of Tentai GE. And uh, so uh, whether we conscious or not, uh, 3,000 realities there. I think uh, this is uh, based upon the uh, Huayen Sutra Kengongyo. Uh, everything is uh, uh, Oneness, one, oneness is included everything. So this is uh, uh, what the Shakyamuni Buddha enlightened very first at the moment of awakening. Uh, he really uh, uh, meet his uh, himself, Shakyamuni Buddha, and the world is one. So universe and uh, oneself is uh, really uh, contained in the universe. Universe also include oneself. So this kind of idea is very uh, rational way of understanding a G is thought, I think. And uh, he arranged the basic 10 uh, aspect that is from the Lotus Sutra of Chinese version, uh, especially uh, the uh, second chapter discusses about the Jiu Nyoze, 10 uh, realities. So, uh, but according to the original Sanskrit, only five, he enlarged another uh, five, so total 10. So this kind of 10 systems, what I mentioned before, this is influenced by the Yogacara schools uh, because already Yogacara school was there in China. Uh, uh, and so at the, it's, it is interesting to, think of such total way of understanding of GEs. Is that thank okay? You. Thank, you, thank you, Sensei. Thank you. Uh, Ushin, do you have a question? Or oh, somebody else have a question? Hold, hold on a moment. Yes, Mushin. Uh, I understand that Saichu was only in China for like seven or nine months. Around nine months, yeah. Right. He did all this in five months. Yep, it was a quick study. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that he he gave lectures, famous lectures on the Lotus Sutra right. before you ever went. To oh yeah, no, he China. no the Lotus Sutra had been in in Japan for quite a while, and I understand that he was introduced to uh, to Tiantai through. Uh, Think one of his teachers, or that's right. Yeah. So it wasn't as it, it is presented like all of a sudden he goes to China and brings all this back, but a lot of this was already no the available, the, right? The, um, as a matter of fact, there are there was a tradition that Prince Shoroku had written right. a piece, and that was in the sixth century. So it's not to say that the lower sutra wasn't available. However, things like the Moha Chikwan were not available. Things such as the commentaries that, that uh, Chi Yi did were not available. So he had brought many of those things to Japan, which were not the Lotus Sutra itself, and you know, and a number of other things. But the Tiantai system per se was not necessarily available, as well as some of these other, other materials. Good question. Yes. And then he also brought back the, the two world mandalas, the Abhisheka that he received. That's right. He received Abhisheka, which is in Japanese called Kanjo, which is the anointment that gave him the, from a Chinese perspective, and then later from a Japanese perspective, that gave him the um, legitimacy to teach, and specifically to teach the Mikyo or the esoteric materials. He brought back the ties of time. And we got a Brian, okay. Jake, and Joe. Okay, first Brian, then Jake, then Shoshin. Also, you had your hand up. Shoshin, Sandy, Shoshin, not Shoshin, Chikima Sensei. So, Brian, why don't you go ahead first? 
Um, so less questions than, than, than things that have been set off in my mind. Number one is many, many years ago, I found a website about Tendai that simply that, that said that Tendai, I don't even think it exists anymore. What looked at all practices and said um, that that was part of the Buddhist path. And that's what, and that is how I got into the Lotus Sutra because it just rang a bell with me that this, this completely made sense. And there was like a triangle of Royal blue links that took you to all different practices. And I still remember it. And when you were explaining about at the end about the 3000, it's almost like in physics that the electron can be anywhere and it's nowhere until you look at it. So in the same way, the Dharma is everywhere. And until you look at a specific instant, the particular instant you're in, and you look and you make the choice to look at it with, with Dharma and, and, and approach it through the eightfold path, then it comes like into focus. And there's all those other things that are not going to come into focus because in this particular moment, it's one of the 3,000. And, and that's how kind of you, you, you have both the, to me, the eternal or the permanent, which is the Dharma, and the very specific, which is that particular moment in which you find yourself. Like at that moment, you know, is it a wave? Is it a particle? Well, it's a wave and a particle, depending on how you're looking at it. So that, I love Tendai for that, because to me, it, it matches up with physics. Right. Well said. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Joe, you had a, a question or a comment? Yeah, yes. Uh... Half question, half comment. Um, so uh, you you said, and many times you have said in the past that the Chigi is really the one who established um, Chinese Buddhism. And I, I think it needs to be qualified. I think Chigi didn't intend to that was not the objective. He didn't self-consciously try to create Chinese Buddhism. It was a result, it seems to me. And also, and, and so when I think about developing American Buddhism, there seem, there seem to be two ways. One is to Americanize uh, Buddhism, right? um, translating uh, Buddhist values into American or democratic values. Or that what I see in Chigi is he really tried to take a very inclusive, pluralistic approach. Uh, and in Chigi's approach, I, I see Theravada, I see Mahayana, right? And so inclusive that he his, uh, eventually he was um, he he made a, his his approach made a huge impact in China uh, of, of Buddhism in China. But I think I don't see that he actually tried to create Chinese Buddhism. I think his Buddhism was beyond the, the category of Chinese Buddhism. I, I would I would agree with you, but I would I would still stipulate that it was his intention to try to unify the teachings. And that unifying the teachings resulted, and, and you're right when you're saying it was a result of what he had done that it became Chinese, not necessarily that he was attempting to make it Chinese. I don't think he attempted to make it Chinese. I think he was trying to unify it, and through the unification, the result was that it became Chinese. Mm -hmm. So I, I would agree with you there. Go, please, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, and I think the key was, it seems the key was the Lotus Sutra. The inclusive approach of the Lotus Sutra allowed him to uh, undertake uh, or develop such an inclusive approach. Um, I, I would agree. I would agree with you. Yeah, which, which of course he referred to as the complete teaching. That was the final and complete teaching. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Sandy, you had a you had your hand up before. Yes, this is very mundane, but um, on your uh, lovely handout for this evening, you have a, a, a sweet little um, picture of of Chi. -E. And would you please explain to people how we would know that is Chi E, even if it weren't on the sheet? If you know what I'm, if you know what I'm referring to. 
I, I do. Thank you. You know that it's Chi Gi because if you look at the top of his head, there's a little stone sitting there. And the little stone is there in this picture because that's what he did to make sure that when he was sitting meditation, he didn't fall asleep because if he fell asleep, the stone would fall off his head and hit him in the hand or the knee or whatever and wake him up. So that was a device. Right. That he, You've got to we be can all, uh, We can all relate to that. <laughs> 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 so that that's a good that's a good point when you're sitting meditation don't sit with your head down <laughs> sit with your head up <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you thank you Shoshin. yes are there any other quick yeah. questions because we're gonna have to jake had one oh jake please go ahead yeah so i was wondering because on the sheet it describes chi as being the de the de facto leader of tiantai and i was wondering why that is like was there somebody else who had similar ideas at the same time, or what, well, there what's were, the story there? Were there? Two, there were two people that had preceded him on with the teachings that he passed down. His teacher, who taught him, we we're talking about where did the three thousand worlds uh, in one moment come from, for instance, and that probably actually the, the the idea, the genesis of that came from his teacher, and that teacher's teacher. So in only in retrospect do they name the other two people, the founder and the second ancestor, and then Chi Gi became the third. He was the de facto because he's really the person who um, made it a big deal that there were the two teachers before him were important in, in the teachings, but at that time there was not a Tian Tai school. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, and I'm gonna ask now, that the people here, because we have time, we got to go out to the hondo. So, and so very briefly, I just want to mention that uh, often, and this is by way of a dark, very brief Dharma talk, often I'm asked by people for a recommendation for a book on introduction to Buddhism sort of thing. And, and to be candid, you know, when I was teaching uh, at Bard College at Simon Rock, um, you know, you look at a course like that, and I had a, a, I would have a textbook, then I would have half a dozen or so ancillary tech, ancillary works. Some of them might be a sutra, some of them might be a commentary, some of them might be some interesting um, material, but in that case. You know, you look at a, an academic year and the way a professor looks at it is for a particular class, you have two one and a half hour sessions a week over 13 weeks. And so you have how many hours does that make it of actual instruction uh, to actually discuss it? Well, there's no single book that can sort of do that. You know, there's you can you can read a lot of books and get a lot out of it. Uh, that's not what I'm suggesting is that you can't get an out of lot out of reading. But I think that, that realistically, um, we have to recognize, and, and, and so some of the books that I recommend are Sangrak Shita's Guide to the Buddhist Path is an example. And I was thinking, the reason I was thinking about this is I was looking, uh, Donald Lopez came out with a book on, and I think it's something like Introduction to Buddhism or some such title. and. I got to tell you that I would not give that to a person as an introduction to Buddhism. I love Donald's writings, and I think that they're very good, and I certainly recommend any, any of Donald Lopez's uh, materials. But for the person who doesn't have an exposure to Buddhism, where you look at the foundations of Buddhism by Gethin, or you look at Buddhism, uh, an insight by Kuhn, these are all really good books. But the thing about, about Buddhism is that many of you have heard me say that Buddhism is a search for the nature reality. And ultimately that's, that's the, the elevator <laughs> and the zinger. Uh, and I'll stand by that, but that leaves a lot unsaid. And last week I was discussing Wabi Sabi. And, and I think that I, I said something to the effect that most Japanese people when asked what Wabi Sabi is, will tell you that it's not so much of a concept as a feeling. And I think in many ways, you can say something similar about Buddhism with a slight twist. 
And that is Buddhism is not a concept, but a process by which we become better human beings. Not even Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, just plain better human beings, ultimately. And once we know the nature of reality, becoming a better human being is a natural outcome. Once we become the best human being we can be, the nature of reality becomes clear. Those two things, a search for the nature of reality and in the process of becoming better human beings are integral to the Buddhist path. And I don't know that we can get that from a book. I think that that's, we can, we can learn something about the teachings. We can see something about the philosophies, the histories, all of those things which are really necessary. But Buddhism provides the mechanism for the search of the nature of reality as well as how to be a better human being. But Chi Gi makes the point, and it's a very important point, that it's the combination of the canon, the scriptures, the commentary, as well as the practices. And by practices, I'm not talking about just meditation. I'm talking about Shila, I'm talking about morality and ethics. Those are practices. Things like meditation are really important. And we think of those as practices, but they're, they're really methodologies to encourage our other practice, which is compassion. And so how do we put that into a book? It's really difficult. I'll still, I'm still searching for the best book to give somebody who's asking the question. But recognize that Buddhism itself is a process, and that process is incredibly important. And there's important things that we learn from the books and that are necessary. But ultimately, it's the combination of the canonical materials as well as the practice that bring Buddhism to us. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening.